fellow believers in Christ Jesus. Hello and welcome once again to Bill King Ministries and I'm Pastor Bill King bringing you the Word of God here on this Sunday morning, May 29th, Memorial Day here, holiday here in the United States. And I'd like to take a moment before I deliver this message to uh, just say a a good praise and a thank you to all the men and women who have served in the U.S. military and laid down their lives, the ultimate sacrifice, so that me and you, their brothers and sisters, could have the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. I thank them. Tithing, that is, giving a tenth of a person's income to God via a church, is a contentious subject for many. I've often heard those harboring a disdain for churches, particularly ones with a larger congregation, use their dislike for the matter as their excuse for non-attendance. Well, hang on to your hats and join me as we delve into God's word on the matter of tithing, seeing what we may discern. The title of my message today is The Institution of Tithing. Tithing is defined as giving one-tenth of one's property and or earnings, that is money, to God. How did the Christian tradition of tithing come into being? For one thing, it's not merely a tradition. It's a requirement of all Christians with its roots planted deeply in biblical history. In the book of Leviticus, Chapter 27, God lays out his groundwork to his great prophet Moses for delivery unto his chosen, the ancient Israelites, defining the situations wherein specific tithes or percentages of certain things, such as animals, fruits of the field, and personal property were expected as holy offerings unto him. As the ancient Israelites were primarily farmers, shepherds, and or livestock owners. The items, articles, and possessions tithe were assigned certain monetary values, enabling computation in determining value in correlation with one tenth. In quoting Leviticus 27:30, and all of the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And continuing on in Leviticus 27, 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to God, to the Lord. Thereby we see the one-tenth valuation system applied to tithes, such as is customarily offered to God down through our modern era. Although God was calling upon tithes of animals, fruits of the field, and personal property, doing so, to the nat- doing so because of the nature of the ancient Israelites' livelihoods, the one-tenth valuation requirements transcended The Old Testament era was modified by believers to incorporate the commonality among modern-day Christians, money. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find God issuing a decree to the ancient Israelites regarding tithing at the end of every three-year period, specifically addressing the Levites that is, the Hebrew tribe known for and assigned specific duties involved in the Jewish religious worship and practice of Judaism, as well as strangers, orphans, and widows, granting them privileges intended to raise them up. And we quote Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within our gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger, 
and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates, may come and eat and be satisfied, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. In doing so, God's intent and purpose of tithing and tithes was established. That is, to aid those in need, particularly in a sense of Christian brotherly love. In the book of Malachi, we find the great prophet of God speaking the words of God, addressing the chosen regarding not tithing, that is, stealing from God what is rightfully his, and the rewards of adhering to his commandment on tithes and tithing. And we quote Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. God, through the prophet Malachi, stated unequivocally to his chosen the seriousness of not tithing. They would be cursed. Additionally, verse 10 of this passage is from where modern-day ministers practicing so-called prosperity gospel pull their doctrine and justification in preaching that the more one tithes, the wealthier they will become. Taking God's promise of a blessing and equating it into money in man's typical self sinful fashion, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that's from 1 Timothy 6.10. Yet tithing goes back even further in biblical history. Back to the days of Abraham, the Hebrew father of Judaism, as found in the book of Genesis, wherein Abraham, returning from defeating the armies of Chedorlaomer and the kings who fought with him, as they had raided the region and kidnapped Abraham's nephew, Lot, and then meeting the great high priest of God, Melchizedek, and we're quoting Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now in categorizing Jesus Christ as among the order of Melchizedek, an internal great high priest, the Apostle Paul made mention of Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. And we're quoting from Hebrews 7, 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to him also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of Man, remains a priest continually. In this narrative, we see the one-tenth valuation applied 
as was later decreed unto Moses, as referenced in Leviticus 27.32. Therefore, having established the history, meaning in God's intent for tithes, one-tenth of all unto him, let's now discuss some of the issues with modern-day tithing, such as has brought about the grave disdain I mentioned for the institution that I referenced in the opening of this message. Churches, that is, the ministers, pastors, preachers, the clergy, and the church's administrative staff are supposed to be good stewards of any and all tithes. As the tithe is offered to God, the church is merely the conduit. Churches are to use tithes in aiding and assisting those within their communities, as well as abroad in the case of missions and missionary efforts to those who are less fortunate. The stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates, as stated in Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29. Additionally, some churches may or may not use tithing as a way and means of providing salaries to the clergy, as well as providing monetary support for a church's administrative staff and the cost incurred in maintaining the facilities and providing for administrative supplies and purchases. Now all of this is viewed as completely normal and in accordance with the Word of God. However, Problems occur, causing the negative perception of the institution of tithing when ministers, pastors, and preachers, the clergy, as well as other church-affiliated personnel, steal from God, dipping into the tithe resources, that is, money, to better themselves for their own personal gain or satisfaction. For example, a few years back, a prominent pastor of a megachurch in the Atlanta, Georgia area, and this is in recent years, demanded from the, from the congregation and received ties which he used for the purpose of purchasing a small jet airplane, convincing the congregation God had told him one was necessary for him to spread God's word to the far corners of the world. Poppycock. There have been other numerous documented cases of the misuse, misappropriation of ties by church officials, such as purchasing luxurious automobiles, funding elaborate parties and social gatherings, supporting lavish and extravagant lifestyles of the clergy members, and, as shocking as it may seem, soliciting sexual affairs and triest from prostitutes. Also, ministers, pastors, and preachers, the clergy, demanding more than the customary and established one-tenth from church members. As in the example of the Atlanta pastor purchasing a small jet airplane, he knew the exact purchase amount of the jet in question. Therefore, he divided the amount equally among the congregation, informing each of the exact amount he God, expected him to tithe. More shocking is the fact they gave without question lambs to the slaughter. Additionally, churches are not, some churches are not keeping an accountability system and or sound bookkeeping methods and procedures to track each tithe dollar offered to God via the church. Not doing so only serves to draw suspicion as to where and how the tithe dollars are being used, whether it's in accordance with God's will. In other words, to coin an old saying, there could be a fox in the hen house. Now, unfortunately, these type situations and occurrences are becoming more commonplace 
and are being discovered throughout all religious denominations and or affiliations. You see, the sinfulness of man knows no boundaries. In order to dissolve the negative perception of so many disgruntled churchgoers regarding tithing, greater control and accountability procedures should and must be put into effect so the institution of tithing, as established and called upon by God the Father Most High, can return to the light of holy and righteous obedience to Him, as once viewed by all Christians. The accurate history and intent of tithing, as pertained in the Holy Bible, should be taught and re-emphasized throughout all denominations and affiliations. Money, or rather the love of money, is the roots of all kinds of evil. From 1 Timothy 6.10 The lure of money, even tithe money, can oftentimes be, to not only our shock and awe, but God's as well, too much of a temptation for those who by their calling and positions within the confines of God's churches are in positions wherein it is relatively easy to sinfully take from God. Unfortunately, it's the lure and temptation of money which prompts some to seek the pulpit in the first place, not out of a higher calling by God. In direct conflict, with the teachings of the Son, Jesus Christ, as illustrated in the parable of the rich man. I'm quoting Luke 18, 18 through 23. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Jesus established, therefore, salvation and faith in him doesn't center on monetary riches or possessions, rather on giving and having and exercising a servant's mindset and heart, putting the wants and needs of others before ourselves. So-called mega-pastors would be wise to realize this truth, as well as anyone operating under the same notion of getting rich off God. Jesus' teaching regarding money and earthly possessions, repenting of their sin of wanting desire to have anything and everything the almighty dollar can bring them. While millions of people suffer and die throughout the world for lack of the basic necessities of life. And Jesus further illustrated his point by saying, Give to him who asks of you, and from whom, from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And we find that in Matthew 5. 42. That brings us to the point of this message. Tithing. It's not just a Christian tradition, rather a bona fide requirement rooted deep in biblical history, originating from the ancient Hebrews' worship and practice of Judaism, passed down and modified by modern-day worshipers and practitioners of Christianity. As such, it should not be frowned upon nor ignored as it is a fundamental necessity. 
In conclusion, it is my hope this message concerning the roots, purpose, scope, as well as the negative perception shared by many regarding tithing and tithes serves to reaffirm within each of us the obedient faithfulness called for in our walk with God and the Son, Jesus Christ. Blessings to all who read and or hear this message. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the blessings and gifts you so graciously bestow upon us. We reaffirm our faith and commitment to both you and the Son, Jesus Christ, in obedient adherence to all your commandments and Christ's teachings. We call upon your divine authority and power to ensure all ties, your offerings, giving and received, are put to efficient and effective use in, the promot in promoting the health and well-being of so many of your less fortunate children as well as supporting sound discipleship of your word throughout the world. Be with us, guide us, and keep us. And this we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.